Presidential politics and the candidate who says he's being ignored by the media. We'll talk with Texas Congressman Ron Paul in a moment. But there is other news. And joining, uh, joining us now from Houston, Texas, and continuing our 2012 one-on-one -on -one series is Republican Congressman and presidential candidate Ron Paul. Congressman, welcome back to Fox News Sunday, sir. Thank you, Chris. Good to be with you. Uh, you just heard Director Fugate talk about all of the things that FEMA is doing to help people in the path of, of Irene. But you talked uh, a couple of days ago about that we should do things the way we did all the way back in 1900. Let's take a look at what you said. FEMA is not a good friend of most people in Texas because all they do is come in and tell you what to do and can't do. You can't get in your houses, and they hinder the local people, and they hinder volunteers from going in. So there's no magic about FEMA. Congressman, you would really, at this point, do away with FEMA and all the things it's doing to help hundreds of thousands of people along the <laughs> East Coast? Have you ever read the reports that came out of New Orleans and all those wonderful things they did, giving checks to people who didn't even live there, by, you know, sending in hundreds of millions of dollars worth of trailers that they had to junk because they didn't meet FEMA standards? No, it's a, it's a, it's a system of bureaucratic central economic planning, which is a policy that is deeply flawed. So, no, you don't get rid of something like that in one day. Matter of fact, uh, I've had this position for a long time, and the people kept reelecting me, and I have a coastal district. But I've also suggested that there's different ways to finance this, too, because actually FEMA is in big trouble financially. Their uh, flood program is about $20 billion in debt. So it's deeply flawed. But e even back then when I refused to vote for the bailout money, because we didn't have any money. I mean, this idea that government could just bail out everybody and vote for money. But I propose that we sp uh, save a billion dollars from the overseas warmongering bring half that home, put it against the deficit, and yes, tide people over until we come to our senses and realize that FEMA has been around since 1978. It has one of the worst reputations for a bureaucracy ever. I win elections because I fight for the constituents to overcome the bureaucracy. You can't imagine how many calls we get because FEMA's getting in the way and they can't get their checks, they can't get their bail out. Then these checks go to, uh, uh, you know, contractors and the contractors and the people don't end up with with the money. The contractors end up so, with the money. Sometime in no bid contracts. So, so, so it is a, anybody who wants to defend this uh, department and this agency, they have a tough argument to, to uh, argue for. So, so briefly, Congressman, I assume that if the administration comes, because as we say, FEMA's running out of money, it's the end of the fiscal year and they may have a lot of costs right now. I assume if the Obama administration comes and asks for an emergency funding bill for FEMA, you're a definite, <clears throat> excuse me, you're a definite no. <laughs> well, where would the money come from? We don't have any money. What are you going to do? Go hat in hand to China and borrow the money? But I would consider what I just said because I have, uh, I have precise beliefs in what we should do, and I want to transition out of this dependency on the federal government. But I would say, yes, uh, Obama, you want a billion dollars? Cut two billion dollars. Quit that war in Libya that is undeclared and unconstitutional. Bring those troops home. Save two billion dollars. Put a billion against the deficit. And yes, tide our people over. I mean, we we be conditioned our people that FEMA will take care of us and everything will be okay. But you don't. You try to make these programs work the best you can, but uh, you you can't just keep saying, oh, they need money. Well, we're out of money. This country is bankrupt. So this idea that uh, uh, the bleeding heart will say, well, we have to take care of them. I mean, the whole idea of FEMA is to a gross distortion of insurance. Matter of fact, FEMA creates many of our problems because they, they sell the insurance because you can't buy it at, you know, from, a, from a private company, which means there's a lot of danger. So we pay people to build on beaches, and then you have to go and rescue them. So it's so far removed from the market and the understanding of what insurance should be about. Insurance should measure risk. It shouldn't be a bailout program endlessly and encourage people to make mistakes. And that's what we continuously do in the flood-prone areas. Congressman, uh, your, and you've expressed them here, your libertarian views uh, are certainly somewhat unconventional, but they have picked up growing support in this race. And let's take a look at the numbers if we can. Uh, the latest Gallup poll shows you in third place in the GOP presidential race with 13 percent behind Perry and Romney, but ahead of Bachman and all the other candidates. 
And in a matchup with President Obama, you're now basically even at 47% to 45. Question, what's going on here? Why are you gaining such traction this year? Well, because it's a good idea, and it's the American ideal. But I, I, I'm fascinated with your word, unconventional. Isn't it strange that we can apply that term to freedom and liberty and the Constitution, limited government, and a balanced budget? You're proposing this unconventional idea of government. Well, I think you're right about it. Today, under today's circumstances, it has been unconventional for probably for about 50 years. But right now, the Tea Party movement and the independents in this country and the people who are caring about our bankruptcy, they, they think that what we've had is unconventional with regards to our Constitution and the principles of liberty. So, yes, people are waking up and they're saying, yeah, Ron Paul's right. Why are we fighting all these undeclared war? And why do we have a Federal Reserve that bails out the rich and, and dumps on the poor? And why is it that deficits don't really matter and politicians just stand around and talk that they're going to nibble away at a budget deficit that's 10 years out? So, no, this is a very popular philosophy, and it's not my philosophy. It's the philosophy of the Constitution, it's the philosophy of liberty, private property rights, and not dependency on government. That is the big thing. People are supposed Con to assume some responsibility for themselves in a free society. Congressman, I want, I want to explore what your goal is in this campaign, and I want to read from a, an interesting profile of you in the latest issue of Time magazine. Let's put it up on the screen. Uh, as presidential contender, Paul remains an extreme long shot. But as profit, he is still defining the GOP race. Paul's allies say he's more interested in influence than political power. He does not have a great personal desire to be the president, says Jesse Benton, Paul's campaign manager. Uh, my question is, are you in this to win it, or is it enough for you just to shape the debate? Yes, uh, a minute to win it, and you're absolutely right. I do say that I'm more interested in influence and power. Matter of fact, as president, I would reduce the power of government. I wouldn't seek it. I would never take the power from the Congress. I would not go to war without congressional approval. So, yeah, I resent the power that has uh, galvanized in the executive branch, in the judicial system, and I would want to shrink the size of government. So that is exactly right. But that doesn't mean I don't want to win. It means I want a new approach, uh, you know, at least from current standards, for the presidency. I want to obey the Constitution and follow its very, restri very great restrictions on the government. The Constitution was written to restrict the government, not to restrict the people. Now it's turned around. We, we use government to restrict the people in, in all, all manners. So I would like to reverse that. You've, uh, let's turn to foreign policy, which you've addressed a couple of times already uh, in, in this conversation. While uh, most people celebrated the toppling of Libyan leader Gaddafi this week, you did not. You said this. The current situation in Libya may be a short-term victory for empire, but it is a loss for our American Republic. Worse still, Gaddafi's successor is likely to be just as bad or worse than Gaddafi himself. Question, you really don't think that getting rid of this murderer, the, as Reagan called him, the mad dog of the Middle East, the architect of Pan Am 103, you don't think getting rid of Gaddafi is a good thing? No, I think it's a good thing. I think it's the way we did it, but uh, why is it that we started doing business with him five years ago? Was that a good thing? I, I think that was silly too. But uh, was it a great thing to get rid of Saddam Hussein? Yes. But do we have a great result in Iraq? No, we've delivered Iraq to the Iranians. So I would say long-time consequences are very, very important. We have no idea what's going to come out of Libya. I'm very skeptical. But maybe it'll be a miracle and everybody will be wonderful and they'll have Western democracy and everybody will please. But I'm predicting that's not going to happen because we've already said troops are needed now to maintain order. Nobody even knows who the uh, rebels represent. And there's good evidence that the Al-Qaeda is there. So we may be delivering Al-Qaeda another prize. They'll be in Libya. They weren't there before. And also, the Al-Qaeda is in Iraq now. So these unintended consequences of our foreign policy are so overwhelming. Logic tells us uh, that we shouldn't be dealing with our foreign policy in this manner. We should be dealing for national security in defense of our country and not pretending that we can pick the dictators around the world. It's been very unsuccessful, and American people are waking up to this. The one telltale sign of, where I, of, of the support I'm getting is because of my foreign policy, 
policy, I get more donations from active military duty people than all the other candidates put together, which tells me a lot and should tell the American people a lot. And having been in the military for five years, believe me, I have a little bit of understanding. In the 1960s, I wasn't anxious for Johnson to expand the war in Vietnam. There was no way I was encouraged that. Military people want to defend this country, but they don't want perpetual war when they're undeclared and you don't see the end and you don't know who the enemy is and there's too many restrictions on how they retaliate against the enemies and they get tired. Our Air National, our guard units are over there. Our guard units should be here taking care of us when we have floods. But no, they're overseas and the military is worn out. It's time for a change. If for no no other reason. We're flat out broken. We can't afford the empire anymore. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I've got a couple of more questions I want to ask you when we're running out of time. You are a disciple of what's called the Austrian School of Economics. What is that, briefly? Uh, and, and, and what would economists like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, who were two of the leaders of the Austrian School right. of Economics, what would they say is the right way to deal uh, with boosting the economy now and with dealing with our national debt? Well, they asked Mises that one time. They were having runaway inflation in Austria. It's Austrian economics because the main leaders of the school came. They escaped. They were mostly Jewish, and they came over here to escape uh, Nazism. And they asked him once at the height of a crisis like this, and there was a, a bit more inflation, and they said to uh, Mises, uh, what would you do? And he said, I'd resign. In other words, Take your hands off of it. Let the people take care of it. Let the people who have lived beyond their means, let them go bankrupt. Let the liquidation occur. Get rid of the malinvestment like we did in 1921. We recovered. It's not even in, hardly in our textbook about the Depression of 1921, which was a natural consequence of the inflation for World War I. So we want our hands off. The Depression lasted 17 years because we wouldn't do that. Japan has had hands-on. They've been in the doldrums for 20 years. So, and we're now into this one. It's a lot more than five years. We're basically been in over 10 years that our economy has been slipping. So they would say, hands-off, give us a sound currency, free up the markets, property rights, enforce contracts, make sure people go bankrupt when they're bankrupt, and don't bail out their buddies. Don't let the Federal Reserve create money out of thin air and bail out their bunnies, uh, buddies. But the most important thing about Austrian economics is the artificially low interest rates which cause business people, savers, and consumers to do the wrong things. They make mistakes. So right. they, it's sort of like a price control that causes all the problems. And, and Congressman, we have less than a minute left. Uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke announced this week that he is not going to take any uh, immediate action to boost the economy. Do you think that your criticism, which is now being echoed by some other Republicans, both in the presidential race and in Congress, do you think your criticism may have led him to pull back? Well, he really hasn't pulled back. Symbolically, he has, and he's not having another QE3. But he has maintained that he will keep interest rates low for up until 2013. He can't keep interest rates low without monetizing debt because if somebody else doesn't buy it, he has to buy it. So he's continuously quantitatively easing. So Greenspan did that when he held interest rates too low too long, and he, cr he was instrumental in creating the bubble. So th it is not a big change in things. He at least, uh, but he sort of said, oh, it's up to the Congress. You know, if the Congress, it's all the Congress's fault, they need to deal with this because he's sort of throwing up his hands. But all he needs to do is quit monetizing debt. Interest rates would go up and Congress would be forced to cut. That is why gold backing a currency, a gold standard, restrains big government. Governments can't spend endlessly for entitlements, and they can't spend by deficit financing to fight these endless wars. Congressman Paul, we're going to have to leave it there. We want to thank you so much for joining us and for the uh, economics lesson as well, sir. Always a pleasure to talk with <laughs> you, you, and we'll, we'll see you on the campaign trail. Appreciate it, Chris.